The story of population dynamics and the study of predators and prey is written in the creatures and the plants and animals all around us. This film is going to show some of that. The effects of human impact on the natural environment can be both dramatic and devastating. Here in Halton, we have a natural environment that has undergone a remarkable recovery from the dark days of the Industrial Revolution. That recovery and its impact on the species we feature provide many clues that bring us to a better understanding of population dynamics and feeding relationships. Before we go any further, let's make sure you know some of the important concepts in population dynamics and feeding relationships. Autotrophs generate their own food from raw elements, normally the power of the sun. Heterotrophs ingest energy directly from other organisms such as this caterpillar grazing on a stem. Mutualism. This is where two or more organisms benefit from a relationship. For example, ants milk aphids for their honeydew, a sticky sweet secretion. The aphids benefit because the ants defend them from potential predators like the ladybirds. Parasitism is a relationship in which one species benefits at the expense of the other. Here we can see a door beetle which is hosting a parasitic mite. Parasitic relationships can be devastating to the host species. In honeybees, the recent collapse of many colonies has been caused by an accidentally introduced parasite, the varroa mite. This has serious implications for our agricultural industry as honeybees are crucial pollinators for many crops. Predation describes a biological interaction where a predator organism feeds on another living organism or organisms known as prey. A food chain is a flow of energy from one organism to another in a community. The producer is the grain, the primary consumer is the vole, and the secondary consumer is the kestrel. This little fella is a short-tailed field vole. It's the main food of the common kestrel. It's going to help us answer the question, does the predator control the numbers of prey? The obvious answer would seem to be yes. If a kestrel eats a vole, then it has reduced the total number of voles in a given area by one. In a year, a kestrel will eat the equivalent of 520 voles. A pair and their four chicks will consume something like 1,400 voles from within their territory. Intuitively, we might guess that any predation will necessarily reduce the prey population size. But this is not necessarily true. Mortality caused by predation can be compensatory. Predation may compensate for mortality that would have occurred anyway. Due to competition, weather or other factors so that predation has no effect on population size. On the other hand, mortality due to predation can be additive, taking individuals that would not have died for other reasons. If this happens, the prey population growth rate will be affected, unless it can be compensated by a reduction in intraspecific competition. What is intraspecific competition? This occurs when two or more individuals of the same species strive for the same resource. 
This is easily observed, as it often leads to very visual or noisy contests. Many species become territorial in defense of valuable food resources. Robins are an obvious example of this sort of behavior. Birdsong is an audible expression of this contest for resources. Similarly, tawny owls are fiercely territorial. They pair for life and defend their breeding area against all other tawny owls in order to secure the food resources and nesting sites. At the population level, intraspecific competition for resources can bring about the overall decline in population of an organism when it exceeds the carrying capacity of its environment. Carrying capacity is defined as the maximum number of individuals of a given species that a site can support during the most unfavorable time of year without causing deterioration of the site. This is what would determine the maximum number of avocets that can be supported on breeding lagoons, feeding on small aquatic invertebrates without reducing their ability to find enough food to sustain them. Lecking is one of the more extreme examples of visible intraspecific competition. This normally involves the males of certain species displaying on a communal lecking ground. These male dance flies form a lek and compete for the attention of visiting females. They flirt their decorated wings in the hope of enticing the females to mate and also to intimidate the rival males. Birds on feeders demonstrate a dominance hierarchy between species. This is an example of interspecific competition. In ecology, this is a form of competition in which individuals of different species vie for the same resource in an ecosystem. Interspecific competition is a powerful driving force for evolution. Most species avoid this sort of competition by targeting different food resources or exploiting them in different ways. Intraspecific competition in field voles creates cyclical booms and busts in the population. During the boom phase, the population density in a given area increases dramatically. However, there comes a point when there are too many voles and not enough food. There then follows a dramatic die-off and the numbers of voles crash. Most vole populations undergo these crashes on a three or four year cycle. In the vole's boom phase, kestrels do very well and raise many young. In the year following a crash, there may be so few voles around that kestrels don't even breed. And in the worst years, many kestrels move out of an area in search of better food resources or die of starvation. The actions of humankind have had, and continue to have, a profound impact on the natural environment, even to the point of tipping the balance in predator and prey relationships. This is West Bank in Widnes, an area that was so ravaged by industrial pollution at the turn of the 19th and 20th century that the average life expectancy of its residents was a mere 47 years. The pollution was so insidious that any trees that survived were covered in black soot and no trace of lichen or moss could grow on the bark. In terms of the study of population dynamics, this creature, the peppered moth, is one of the most important. The Industrial Revolution created changes which forced this creature to adopt a different colour form a black form. Today in Halton they're virtually all back in this peppered form and that's the change that's been brought about by the Clean Air Act. 
some invertebrate species were able to cope with that pollution because they only fed upon the annual flush of leaves. One such species was the peppered moth. This attractively marked moth is one of the most important pieces of evidence we have in our understanding of both evolutionary processes and predator-prey relationships. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, all peppered moths were like this, white with a liberal sprinkling of black spots. This afforded excellent camouflage protection on the lichen-covered branches where it rested by day and helped to hide it from predatory birds like the great spotted woodpecker. The soot-covered trees of the 19th century meant that these moths suddenly stood out like a sore thumb, making them more vulnerable to predation. Fortunately for the peppered moth, a chance genetic mutation allowed this black form to evolve. Within a few short years, almost 100% of peppered moths in Halton were of the black form. Today, thanks to the huge reductions in atmospheric pollutants, lichens have returned to the trees of Halton, and the peppered form is once again the one best hidden from predators. The black form and this partly melanistic form is now very rare. A perfect indicator of the massive improvements that have taken place in Halton's environment. Predators and their prey live in a constant evolutionary arms race. Some of this can be seen in the evolutionary extremes evident in some of our commonest moth species. The incredible and exquisite mimicry of the buff tip moth makes it look astonishingly like a broken birch twig. While the bird poo mimicking boarded pug creates a different impression in the mind of its predators. Birds know it's there but don't eat it because it reminds them of something distasteful. This magpie moth wants to be seen and recognized. Its brilliant markings attract attention, telling potential bird predators not to bother because it really is loaded with potentially harmful chemical defences. Mimicry is commonly found in many species that are familiar to most people. Malarian mimicry involves potentially harmful species, for example, wasps and bees, that evolve a common colour scheme and pattern to increase the potency of their message. Most potential predators recognize these species as dangerous and leave them alone. Batesian mimics, like these hoverflies, have evolved colors and patterns that are similar to these well-defended species. And though they themselves are harmless, they gain a degree of protection from their similarity to the dangerously armed wasps and bees. This does not, however, protect them from some particularly sharp-eyed insect-eating birds. Feeding relationships can be either simple or complex. In the higher fauna, most predator populations are governed by the availability of prey. Prey levels are rarely limited solely by the impacts of the predator. On the other hand, parasitic predation can cause very dramatic declines in the availability of the host species. Except where man introduces an unpredictable variable, most ecosystems maintain a balance of populations, and change is normally a slow process. In those circumstances where species undergo dramatic population fluctuations, they normally do so on a predictable cycle. What is certainly true is that the health our natural environment determines its carrying capacity and biodiversity. This in turn limits the variety and complexity of feeding relationships that can develop. The more biologically diverse an ecosystem is, then the greater will be the number and variety of predators present within it. Predators are an essential asset, playing a critical role in maintaining the health and balance of an ecosystem. 
Predation may be bad for the individual prey consumed, but for the prey population as a whole, it drives the evolutionary imperative, survival of the fittest.